Leveraging Physician Practices will be presented by Opal Greenway. Opal Greenway is a principal at Stradwater Associates and is the practice leader for our provider operations and strategy group. As an accomplished healthcare and finance professional who focuses primarily on the strategic needs of healthcare service providers, she is an expert in physician practices, compensation, surgery centers, valuations, physician hospital alignment strategies, and regulatory compliance. With that, I'll hand it over to Opal. Thank you, Ashley, and thank you and welcome everyone for joining us on the webinar today. We're hoping today to go over some things and tools that can help you with working with your physician practices. I know that there's a lot of information that is coming out right now, and a lot of people are spending their mornings reading, uh, like I did, reading 880 pages of legislation to figure out what the CARES Act is going to do. But we wanted to provide some um, direct feedback that we have gotten from working with our clients in the past through disaster, whether that be natural disasters um, and other disruptions that might happen in healthcare, as well as influenza pandemics. Uh, and what we've also learned from clients that we've just been talking to in the past couple of weeks that have already experienced surges in their needs and how and what has been working well and what has not been working especially realizing that in talking to some of our clients, there are a lot of you who are on the call today who have not experienced surge yet are, and are probably, you know, a week, two weeks, three weeks. We, I know that this is all very uncertain of when you may experience a surge. So we want to make sure for those of you who are in still hopefully in the preparation mode that you know that there are tools out there and um, understand some steps you can take now that will help prepare you um, in the best way to be able to address this when it does come to your community. So what we want to talk about today is, first of all, dealing with the fact that there is provider and shorting, um, staffing shortages. And um, with that, the supply that we have may not match the demand that we, may, that we need for when a surge happens. On top of that, our, our typical supply is going to be disrupted and accepting that that is the reality. And so how can we prepare for that? Um, services are going to get on hold, which means, you know, physician practices that are typically open and providing services, doing follow-up visits with patients, physicians who are providing surgeries, et cetera, their care as they know it has been disrupted, and we don't know how long it's going to be disrupted for. That means certain practices are going to be shut down. That's going to have a financial implication, what to do with those staff, what to do with those providers. And then how do you recover from hopefully only a trough of financial disruption, but potentially some more, um, very long-term effects? On top of that, there are some compliance issues that we are seeing. We have not been getting from the government some of the waivers that we are hoping that may come into impact, but things that you do need to make sure that you're taking into consideration now to protect yourself in the long run. And then on top of that, we will go over some of the current government relief and regulations that we do recognize are constantly changing, but hopefully going over the ones that have been enacted as of last night slash this morning and ones that are hopefully coming down the pipeline. Um, and as, as always, Stradwater will continue to provide as we know changes in legislation or additional relief stuff. We will make sure that we get that information out to um, you as it comes along the ways. So. Start, um, starting with the overall supply for the practices, first step is understanding exactly what your supply is right now. Do you know exactly what you have access to on, on a regular basis? And that's what I consider the starting step, um, point. That means understanding exactly how many physicians I have, what specialties they are, what is their FTE status, you know, what do they normally work? And when I start out with that FTE status, I, will, I might realize I have significant number of FTEs who are not a 1.0 FTE. Oftentimes people are doing an, an adjustment for administrative um, tasks so that they might be a 0 0.8, or I might have some part-time providers. Can I reach out to those providers right now and actually determine what is their availability and capacity to serve as full-time? Um, the reality is, is that we may have things that are going to impact our supply, so I need to know what is the absolute maximum I could have access to. On one of the ways of doing that is to take anybody who might have administrative allocations of their time, for example, your chief medical officer or people who are providing medical directorship, et cetera, and actually Opal. increase their clinical hours. Yes? Opal, your slides are not advancing. Oh. 
your, your screen may be paused. Can you see it now? Uh, we're seeing it now. It changed. There we go. That works. Thank you. Carry on. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for letting me know. Um, so as we all adjust to the joys of um, technology impacts of when you are working from a home office. So thank you, Vincent. Um, that being said, so starting with what is, what is your current supply with your medical staff? Then we need to go through and say, what are our non-employed medical staff? We have aligned providers in the community. And on top of that, um, when do we actually utilize those services? And so from that perspective, if you're part of a larger health system, you may have staff that you've re um, relied on that might be coming a few times a month. Maybe they come in from an academic medical center and help provide coverage, you know, two or three days um, a week. Maybe you've been using locum tenens providers. Those are going to be disrupted at this time. People who are going to be in the larger areas that are hit cannot send providers into some of our rural markets that we've worked with to be able to provide coverage that they usually did. On top of that, you have your independent providers who are in the community. What are their ability to be able to provide coverage for you and what are the different ways in which they can provide that coverage? If it's a family medicine physician, are they able to provide any sort of ED coverage? If they are a specialist, can they work in the ICU? Understand what their background is. Oftentimes you may have worked with a provider in one capacity, not realizing that they may be dual board certified, they might have other additional training, they might be able to provide um, other kinds of cross coverage, right? One of the things is oftentimes people look at FQHCs for compared to a critical access hospital that might be historically a competitor or other hospitals in your area. Just because they've historically been a competitor, now is the time that it's absolutely critical to have coordination of care between these units. Being able to know that, it, talk to your fellow hospitals and say, if my OBGYN goes down and I have deliveries, is your provider going to be able to go ahead and do deliveries for babies? Or do you have anybody, how can we allocate our um, providers between potential historically competing um, entities to make sure that we're not having staff burnout, to make sure that we are able to provide that craft coverage? So that you have a full picture of, here's my physician pool that I have for the period I've worked with them, I've created buy-in, physicians are in agreement as to what they will be able to provide to us and what are the things that, um, that I have that full roster and start thinking about schedules and how, how you might be able to do extended shifts. With that being said, a lot of my rural clients have also worked with advanced practice providers. Now, every state has different requirements and, um, with regards to how much you can use your advanced practice provider compared to their license. There are several states out there that are, um, I live in one of them, Tennessee, that is a restricted practice state. So there's a significant limitation to what my advanced practice providers are doing. Certain states are lifting those requirements to allow them to exercise to the full practice of their license. So make sure that you are discussing with your state to see if your state has issued any sort of waiver for those restricted practices. Other states where you have already had the benefit of having your advanced practice providers act in a fully licensed capacity, you need to make sure have you been utilizing them in that way? If you have not, how can you now utilize them in that way? And also, are they comfortable? And are the physicians working with them comfortable? What kind of training do you need to do now so that they can act, exercise at the top of their license? Make sure you reach out and discuss with your payers, because in my experience, a lot of times people just look to the state regulations as to how much they can use their advanced practice provider, but actually it's the payer contract or the medical staff bylaws that limit the provider. So I have a nurse practitioner and I can, you know, who is very well trained, can provide a lot of services and could very much help me out if we have a surge, if, a, um, if another provider goes down. But my own medical staff bylaws are what are limiting what they are able to do. Or my payer contract says I won't be able to bill for any of their services. And, I, and given the topic of this conversation, we have to make sure that we are also putting ourselves in the best financial position so that the services that we provide at this time can we can get paid for um, to the maximum of, of our ability, given the fact that the things that oftentimes are supplying our income are getting disruptive with the elective procedures. So review your medical staff bylaws. If necessary, go ahead and amend them. Make sure that you get the buy-in with the providers because those are the ones who often dictate your medical staff bylaws to be able to make those amendments, even if they're for a temporary, um, for a temporary time period. 
And then also make sure you think about the staff you don't typically use. Who's retired recently? Who's in your community? Are there people who, you know, oftentimes um, you might have a situation where you've recruited a provider who maybe their spouse um, is a part-time and has decided and hasn't been working as a provider because they've, they've retired or they were only going to do part-time and you ended up not employing them, but they still live in the community. Are these people go through your courtesy and emeritus physician list that ha might have privileges on there and understand, okay, can I go ahead and reach out to them? Do that now to make sure you have your backup. And then on top of that, what are my options for telehealth providers? Do I have these currently in place? And if I don't, who are potential options if I've never used telehealth historically? So setting that baseline of what is my true supply right now? Now let's talk about things that are going to happen that are going to impact that provider supply. The big one that I think a lot of people have already experienced, um, I was working with some hospitals that as early as February were having issues of having staff that need to be self-quarantined, right? These are staff that are hopefully very, uh, that are healthy, but they're not able to be able to serve in their capacity, they're at home and, they, and they've been at home for a while. So that can impact your provider supply. This is going to continue to happen where a provider gets exposed and a lot of time places are lifting their self-quarantine requirements for staff and having them to continue to work despite being exposed or something like that until they become symptomatic. And during the symptomatic, I was talking to a trauma physician who's with a, um, out in Ohio who has exposed and she's saying that once you've been unsymptomatic for 72 hours, her hospital is having them go back to work. So just understand what your hospital policy is for that, have that in place and be prepared for that and examine what does that look like from what, how does it create your risk in your hospital from a care delivery, but also how does that impact the fact that you've already set out what supply you have access to, where can you make this trade out? On top of that, your, the, as I mentioned earlier, providers that you get from a larger system might not be available. On your welcome tenants providers, I can tell you right now for the most part are not going to be available. Most of them have already been called in to these larger areas that have had surge and are, um, are in the midst of outbreak. And so with them being unavailable, you not being able to rely on them, realize that if you've used them historically, I would now count that as a 0.0, .0 FTE and I need to find and figure out what my replacement is. On top of that, you need to figure out which providers that you need to protect from exposure because of what your community needs. The one I think about specifically that I have talked to a client about recently is the OBGYN supply. There's nothing that is going to stop the fact that babies are going to be born during this pandemic. And so if you have, if you talk to your OBGYNs and they are expecting a significant number of births that are coming in, you do not want to use that OBGYN provider as a potential backup for somebody else and, and be using them in your emergency department or any of those other places where exposure increases the risk that they're going to be potentially get sick and be out and you are left without people who are able to be able to do these deliveries in a safe way. And again, this kind of gets to where I talk about coordinating with competitive hospitals in your area. So maybe you have a specific area that is going to be designated for being able to do deliveries for this time period rather than multiple places providing the same service. This is the time when we need to figure out which services can we allocate to specific areas to limit our exposure and prevent how many providers we have go, we have go down to COVID um, and exposure so that they are available to provide the care that we need. On top of that, Know what your high-risk patient populations are and what care that they might need and where your potential surges are for their services. This is, includes like your chronic care um, patients and the ones that are not at, at risk for other things, not just COVID, that might end up needing services in your hospital. So is there anything that is going on in your community and working with your um, primary care providers that might create other surges or, or that you have, see, if you have seasonal type um, services that you know you're going to need providers for at a certain time. This would be more of an issue for some of the, some of the places that we're experiencing this in January and February. Um, on top of that, understand, go ahead and plan that providers and staff are going to be out sick for periods of time. You know, during the absolute peak, what we've seen from other disaster issues with um, the American Academy of Family Physicians 
has their checklist for pandemic influenza, that they're seeing on average of, you know, that you need to plan for 40% absenteeism. Imagine for as a rural hospital, what if you can handle 40% absenteeism during any time. And that's because people are both leaving for to take care of their own sick family members or their individual sickness. And what would you do if 40% of your staff at peak time might not be available? So when you evaluate that supply, make sure you're um, addressing what could actually impact that and what happens, what does that supply look like if 40% might be out? So then let's talk about, okay, if we realize this, how do we maximize that provider supply? The key is to talk to be talking to your physicians now, right? If, you, if you're not already in surge, how can you create the buy-in and get everybody on board and involve them in the planning? They know other physicians. Have them work the phones and reach out to other physicians in the community. See who can extend their hours, who can be able to work. Um, identify who can do that cross coverage. Right. Well, I like using family medicine physicians to be able to provide ED coverage. But one thing that I've seen with some of our groups that we've worked with is that they're concerned about what happens if their hospitalists get sick. It's not just people caring for COVID patients. You have patients in your hospital right now who are inpatient. Who is going to be able to do those rounds? Who's going to be able to provide that care in that inpatient setting? And how can you go ahead and set that up? Making sure who's I and with that. Right now, what kind of training do you need to do for these providers so that they'll be able to if somebody goes down, right? And that includes whatever processes and protocols that you might have for care management on your med surge floors and making sure physicians that you don't typically use understand those protocols. That's something you can do right now before you have surge and when you're planning for this. If you do have an ICU department, can there, are there surgical specialists who are um, trained in that who could provide that coverage? Or are they able to do triage work? There are several who have been, who might be an, might be an orthopedic surgeon who can actually do ED coverage or to be able to do that triage aspect. Um, with that, also find out who's been, admin, as I mentioned earlier, who has administrative responsibilities and what is their current clinical competency level. If they've been doing primarily administrative work where they've actually been a 1.0 FTE on the administrative side for a number of years, what have they maintained in their CME and truly understand what level that you can work with them on when what would it take to get them up to the level that is necessary especially now that we've already had some practices go ahead and get shut down this is the time to be doing that with that there are going to be um, providers who are going to be underutilized I've been talking to some orthopedic physicians who right now they're basically their elective procedures are canceled and they are in a wait and see mode they're just seeing their work RVU slip and that they want to help, but aren't sure what they can do to help. Are these ones that you can actually um, shift administrative and crisis managed responsibilities over to these providers that are not going to be as directly involved in patient care in a COVID situation and that they can provide other kinds of guidance and um, tools for, um, for your group and for your hospital. Keep in mind, um, you need to go ahead and actually any provider who is part-time that you're going to expand to full-time, you do need to go ahead and expand their contract so that that, that, that is covered under that, um, at least for a period of time. And then make sure you have everybody has actually hospital privileges. And that includes um, if you're working with a competitor hospital or an affiliated hospital, that privileges go both ways. You're better off going ahead and making sure people have privileges in the maximum number of settings necessary so that you can be able to provide that cross coverage and actually um, share providers as needed. And of course, as I said, check with your medical staff bylaws to make sure and do whatever necessary amendment, emergency amendments that you may need to do to be able to get these to fit underneath those. So. In addition to that, let's talk about creating that supply through telehealth. Uh, some of our groups that we've worked with have a lot of experience with telehealth. That telehealth may be compressed because the telehealth might have been provided by um, a larger entity within a healthcare system that they currently exist, and that might not be available to the same levels as previously. If you do have telehealth currently, though, go ahead and contact who the current providers are, discuss expanding co coverage, discuss make sure that they will be able to continue that coverage if they will not be able to continue that coverage what alternatives can they give you can they put you in the direction of who in your area is already set up 
to be able to do telehealth coverage if they are um, slammed and unable to provide it. And as I mentioned, provide training for physicians who have not historically done health, telehealth. Or do you have physicians who, if they end up in a self-quarantine position, can they provide those telehealth services from home? You know, that there is a basic level of training, understanding that some of the HIPAA requirements under telehealth have been waived for a specific period of time. If you're in a position where you can provide that training in, um, now, go ahead and do so and do your best to set those up in a HIPAA compliant way. I mean, there's a lot of people who are starting to work from home. If you have the availability of hospital or practice equipment that's already encrypted and set up, make sure you set physicians up with that first. Set up your process and your protocol for how do I get these supplies to a physician who ends up being self-quarantined and being at home? Or do I start with providers who are not needing to do it on a self-quarantine basis put those in their hands. If they're going to have to use any sort of personal technology, then making sure that they have basic training on how to set that up. Note there have been some um, significant expansions and waivers for telehealth. That includes, for those of you who attended our webinar last week on revenue cycle, um, they went over and then we do have that recorded on our website, all the different ways in to specifically bill for these telehealth services. But with the waivers, I wanna go over how that actually maximizes your provider supply in they are able to do it, um, how they are able to do it. And that's, they have been expanded that you can do telehealth from a patient's home or any other facility before you had to have a specific origination site and you could only do it for current providers. You could, or sorry, for current patients. You can do this for new patients. So can you set up those family care physicians instead of um, being able to send them to the ED, can they do this through telehealth um, purposes? You can use FaceTime now for telehealth. You cannot use like Facebook Live or anything that might be public facing, but if you have your smartphone and devices, there are specific ones um, and that have been approved for being able to use as telehealth. And I know FaceTime has been become the most popular one um, to be able to use. Also, telehealth is important to be able to use for your chronic care patients right now and your vulnerable pa populations. You do not want these patients showing up in your emergency department, and but they are going to still need a significant amount of care management that is going on. Telehealth is probably the best way in which to be able to work with those patients right now. Do your physician, go ahead and do the training with your physician to be able to provide that care, get the ed um, education out to your patients that that is how you will be handling it for the foreseeable um, future. On top of that, there are specific things that we are still waiting to hear back on with regards to how they're going to do the, um, the telehealth waivers. These are just the ones that have come out so far, as I said, anything that new that comes out and including the reimbursement, please continue to check our website for those updated information. That being said, let's talk about the practices that you have in utilizing those resources. Starting out with primary care providers, I like to use the primary care providers as being the information carriers. Patients uh, have the highest relationship usually with their independent primary care provider, whoever that is. This should be the source that we hope, rather than going always to the media, the hospital can use your primary care providers to do the appropriate messaging out to the community for what patients should do. If they suspect that they have symptoms, where should they go? When do they go to the ED? How to use telehealth? Make sure that you're engaging with your primary care providers to actually make sure that they have reliable information and it is going out to their patients, that the messaging is consistent that they can um, identify when patients need to be in home isolation and that they're working really as your first line of defense to get, prevent people from showing up in your ED unnecessarily and constraining those resources. Primar as I said, primary care is your, your first stop for that. On top of that, for those who do not have a very well integrated EHR and um, system with the practices, your primary care practices are where the location for most of you is, where the data is as to what is going, what is your risk levels as a community, right? They know the individual patients, they know who are the chronic care patients, they know who has acute respiratory illness and what are the asthma rates for, those commu for your community. So they can really help you in the planning of understanding what might impact your supply. Here's how many COPD patients that we have seen in the past couple of months. Here's who was on our books that we were that we're trying to figure out how to reschedule uh, from a care level. 
here, this is our most at risk population. If this whole population ends up getting exposed, here's what are needed. So use them in the data that they have at their fingertips to be able to do some of this planning and then use them to disseminate the information, right? Making sure that you have literature that is very specific to those high risk patients, right? Um, and that those primary care providers and their staff are able to actually get that information out to these patients. We've been talking a lot about the provider staff, but you're gonna have other clinical staff that you can um, are able to deploy from the practice setting if you have shortages. And at likelihood is you are going to have um, shortages. So if the physician practices are closed, evaluate your ability to actually deploy those clinical staff to cover the hospital. And a key on this is not just doing it if somebody comes out. You want to you want to go ahead and plan on potentially having overworked staff. And so how can you minimize and mitigate against that by having this larger pool, like as you would like a float pool amongst, if you have several different physician practices, I oftentimes will set up a float pool. How do you create within your physician practices a very large float pool to be able to utilize in the hospital and how would you be able to stagger and adjust shifts accordingly to prevent overworked staff, to prevent having to use up a lot of overtime and to be able to rotate people through in a way that will be able to give you um, appropriate care management. Um, with this, a lot of times there needs to be cross-training that happens. Providing care in a clinic setting, working as an RN in a physician practice is very different from working in, in the emergency department, on the med surge floor, et cetera. So utilize the time that you have right now to be able to do those cross-training, understand what people's different clinical care competencies are, and then go through. Oftentimes you will have, um, you have your orientation package that you've been using for, for, uh, for staff when they join the hospital. How can that be done? Your, if your nurse educator is busy taking care of patients, how can you be able to do that training with staff now, whether it's also including there's um, resources to be able to do that training virtually for people now. What can you record, you know, what is recorded that you can provide to people so they can get this training while a practice might be closed. Um, on top of that, consider issuing temporary licensing and certification where it's appropriate. If you have a nurse who's inactive or retired, they might be certified in another state. How can you go ahead and do a temporary licensing to be able to increase the stock of that staff? Um, and then also look at what you're using your medical assistance for. A lot of places, if they have certified medical assistance in the groups that I've worked with, sometimes the medical assistant is actually your front desk person. So they haven't, you don't necessarily think of them as being able to provide clinical care. But um, people who have gone through the training on certified medical assistance, they have been trained on doing blood draw draws. They have been trained on a significant number of clinical things that they just might not have utilized in a while. So how can we provide training to refresh some of those skills that we have not used historically? And this includes practice staff that are with your independent providers. I'll talk about the legal ramifications and financial impact of that in just a moment. But keep in mind, this is not just for the practices that you as a hospital might employ. Any independent practice that has these staff that might be closed down is an opportunity for you to have a larger workforce during this time that you might need it. Um, with that, there's also a significant number of non-clinical practice staff that you can tap into and recognizing that those people might end up on leave or sick as well. And so you need to have backups for that. But also, how can you utilize these to be able to, um, in an effective way where you might have, I mean, here in Nashville at Williamson Medical that's down the street from me, they are looking for people who can do additional housekeeping and additional sanitization for that. There's very, you know, basic training that people are able to go through. Is this something that a practices non-clinical staff can be able to provide? Can they do inventory management? Can they be able to, they do check-in at the practice? What training do they need that they can do check-in in the emergency department? On top of that, sometimes these PSRs are, have been used in the hospital or in the physician practice. You have schedulers and coders that can do other settings that they could actually just do from home and if they just had a little bit of remote training. One of those is with regards to your billing services. You have an hourly person in the practice, can you turn them into an hourly person for the hospital to do these billing services? And on top of that, can they, can they learn and addition, do additional skills that you could utilize in the future? One key thing that I like to use these people for is actually the care coordination and communication. Who is doing 
you know, using everybody to the top of their license. If you have standardized communication, can these individuals go and do the communication via phone with your skilled nursing facilities, with um, with other groups in the, um, in the community, with your home health agencies, and be making those phone calls, distributing that information via email um, that they can do from, from their home office or, you know, using um, supplies that you've taken from the practice for them to bring home. On top of that, there are some basic practice activities that the non-clinical staff are going to have to continue working on, such as are they going through and making sure that they have canceled and checked on all of those patients who have had cancellations. They also at this time can also be doing the analysis of what are going to be your patient access needs once we get through this. Knowing that we don't know how long this is going to last, it's not a simple matter of, okay, we have the list of everybody we rescheduled for the month of March. We don't know how long this is going to last, but that list of what your rescheduling needs are going to be needs to can be continuously updated, and it needs to be reprioritized, right? Somebody who might have needed in April because um, we're supposed to do a six-week follow-up, if it ends up that they're not now, it's going to be 12 weeks, they might become a higher need patient than, than someone else. So making sure you're keeping track of that as a practice and constantly doing that reprioritization is a critical step that oftentimes at this, at this time gets ignored because people's focus is on other things. And then think about for how can you do, utilize the resources in your practice that are non-personnel related. One of the key things is space. Are there functions that you can perform in the practices away from the hospital? And that includes whether or not this is going to be an initial care site for people to be, you know, triaged um, before going to the ED for basic testing. Can you go ahead and do, if somebody shows up, can you test them for AB if you don't have the test for coronavirus yet? Knowing that if they test positive for AB, you can send them home with a certain level of care rather than that person ever showing up in the ED. And then of some places of all, that I've talked to are already doing this, that inventory, that you need to have an inventory of the supplies that you have at the practice that you might be able to redirect to the hospital. Some places are realizing that supplies that they got historically from their larger health system are now being um, rationed as to what's coming to them. And so they're having to reevaluate their inventory of supplies. Somebody has asked me recently, how can we go about purchasing and stocking up on extra supplies? I can tell you right now, I'm not seeing that as a possibility um, based on the constraints that are currently happening. So some things that are going to have to be getting creative. I did talk to someone earlier just this morning where they're reaching out and seeing about, can they get supplies from non-traditional places, such as if in your community, do you have a food manufacturing um, distribution group or um, there's a few places where they might be doing semiconductor industry where their fab units actually use protective gear and they've been shut down because their suppliers in China have not been able to give them the sources. So them being shut down, they don't have the same needs for their, for their protective gear. Is that something that can be transferred into the hospital or a clinic setting? On top of that, don't forget your technology supplies that you need how many laptops, tablets, other types of supplies that you can go ahead and work with to make sure you have these telehealth resources if you're going to have the people working from home um, and getting those set up. So with that being said, let's talk about how this, there's compensation issues that go with this. Um, yes, some of this is compliance, and I promise I'm not going over this just because the, my reformed attorney in me to get like to nerd out over this stuff. There are pieces we have not received the waivers that we thought about, but there's financial implications. There are physicians that are on a productivity-based compensation, seeing their productivity that is being depleted and are wondering whether or not they can be kept whole, you know, or they're not going to be getting a paycheck. The thing is, is that you can do these things that right now you can convert. There are options that you have to be able to make sure that you can still pay your physicians and provider staff. One thing, though, is that you, the goal is not to necessarily keep them whole, but, but, actually, but keep them in a good place for when the pandemic, pandemic expires. One thing that it would be start compliant is to set a base salary for a period of time that oftentimes if it's just putting somebody who, if it's a high producer, just leave them at MGMA median as a set base rather than and putting a pause to any productivity-based compensation for this duration. If you are reassigning what a physician is doing, if they are now taking over administrative duties because they don't have elective surgeries, 
you can have that or they or you're having them do crisis management pay them at an hourly rate appropriate that you would like for their administrative duties historically since they're no longer going to be you're putting their work rvus on pause if you transfer a physician from their usual setting so a primary care physician you decide to put them in an ed they it might be a per more appropriate to actually just pay them an hourly compensation rate for an ED physician, or if you're going to have them cover the inpatients in the hospital, if they're going to be acting as a hospitalist, should they be paid at a hospitalist rate? And so I've listed here just so that you have it at your fingertips that currently the national median ED hourly compensation is 100 and just under $172 per hour. For hospitalists, it's just over $146 per hour. These are completely appropriate ways to shift your contract for the time being. If you are able to use an advanced practice provider in a way that you have not historically, make sure you also adjust the compensation for their services at this time. Um, as I said, CMS has not issued a blanket waiver with regards to the Stark Law and anti kickback. You still have to have contracts in place for this. I know it seems it seems silly to a certain extent from um, given the clinical crisis to be able to deal with paperwork, but there are people in your organization, hopefully, who can help you with this, as well as external resources. There already is under the Section 1135 waiver that you can ask that you can apply for a grant of relief from if you had to go about actually enacting this and you paid somebody differently and you did not have the contract in place, you can ask for a waiver. But it's retro, it's, it's in hindsight. It's one of those things that after you're all over with this, you may go through an entire process to ask for forgiveness for this because we do not have these blanket waivers. You can ask for an exception after the fact based on how the waiver is currently written. If we don't get that blanket waiver, for those of you who are not, who are still in planning mode and you don't have the crisis in your area yet, go ahead and put together the templates for emergency coverage. There are a lot of ways to go ahead and go about doing the documentation and justifying of actions that make things stark and anti-kickback compliant. Even if we don't get a complete waiver from CMS, there are ways to do things now that you don't won't have to go through that entire process after the fact of basically asking for an exemption, asking for forgiveness from the Stark laws. And the last thing you want to do to your organization, given the financial hit that a lot of us are going to feel during this time, is then put it at risk and, and get hit by an additional financial penalty because you did not, you were not compliant with Stark. You didn't get the waiver uh, or you did not get the um, relief granted, requested after the fact. So make sure you're setting yourself up now as best as you can. So let's talk about your independent practices and your aligned practices. They're going to get hit with a significant financial hit right now as well. A lot of them are closed. We are delaying elective procedures. Patients are staying at home. We are canceling and basically all non-critical care right now. In that in a lot of our hospitals, you are going to need a lot of these practices to be viable post pandemic and they are going to struggle. Um, and so how, what can you do to help these independent practices? One of the things is if you have historically a PSA arrangement with that practice where they've been providing coverage, go ahead and allow yourself, can you continue to make those payments to the providers at this time, potentially at a slightly reduced rate and basically do a true up later on knowing that you're going to have a surge and hopefully, I, would, I do say hopefully have that surge once we get through this pandemic that all of a sudden you're going to have to do these elective procedures are still going to need to get done. and so go ahead and say we're going to continue to make payments on the monthly basis as we've done historically doing a true up later so that they're continuing to get cash flow into their practices at this time we talked earlier about how can you utilize staff from those practices in the hospital setting well key thing for those practices is making sure that you pay for those leased staff if you're going to utilize them in a separate way and that it's a great thing for a practice to be able to offload the expense of having those staff those hourly wages by having the hospital pay for them while the hospital is using them if you own the facility the medical office building or whatever for where the practice is located consider um, providing rent deferment for those practices on a non-penalty basis that is compliant with stark um, and and anti-kickback legislation to be able to do it at this time. 
you can consider doing a short-term loan to the practice with de deferred repayment options. I'm going to go over other funding sources here in a moment, but as a hospital, you may have an ability, especially even through your foundation, to be able to provide these, this kind of support for those practices at this time. And on top of that, make sure that you are reaching out and providing whatever additional resources are for this practice. There are how many independent physicians across the country right now. It might be sharing this webinar with them. Um, it might be sharing, you know, other resources that you're seeing come across the news to make sure that they're aware of it. I know that some of the people on the webinar that I've received messages from today are ones because the hospital said, hey, I know that there's a webinar that's gonna have information, please attend this. So make sure that they have resources and don't assume that they see everything that you see as a hospital. So let's talk about cash flow a little bit in these practices, right? Your ability to preserve that cash flow right now is absolutely critical to your long-term care. Whether you hear this as financial advice for people who are individually affected, um, you know, a lot of people in the hospitality industry, but this applies to all of our small businesses and particularly our healthcare providers. You need to be able to maximize the cash you preserve now for what for unexpected needs, whether that is your staff going down and trying to find temporary staffing, feeling, you know, before all the supplies were out, being able to get a hold of additional medical supplies. You're going to have changes in payer mix right now. Um, you know, all of your commercial stuff for the most part is being is being held off. And so knowing that for a period of time, even when we come back, are you going to have changes in payer mix of higher Medicare self-pay, uninsured, et cetera, that you're going to be able to um, deal with? You have all these elective pay, um, delays in patient payments. So even if you do provide care, patients are not going to be able to pay their co-pays when they come back to this elective because they might have been hit. So being able to basically hoard as much cash as possible right now is absolutely critical for these practices. Um, we sent out an article that gets into a little bit more details, but there's some of these that I wanna to touch on today. You do need to set up and figuring out what your cash needs are. Do a cash flow analysis for your practice. Luckily, a lot of independent practices I work with already work on a cash flow basis rather than an accrual method of accounting. But regardless, you need to know what are your true cash needs. And so with most people doing their um, financial management of a practice operating off of a P, um, a P&L rather than a cash flow statement, it might have expenses on there that are not actually cash basis. So you're not just looking at the net income of your practice. You need to go through your P&L and figure out which expenses are truly cash, which ones are not. So like depreciation is a non-cash expense. Do you have prepaid? Do you have subscriptions that you've had or, you know, anything that's on there that actually we've, we've set it to be distributed across the entire year, but the cash expense, malpractice insurance, if it's not paid monthly, if it's paid quarterly, what are things on there that are not actually on your cash, on your books that are going to hit you this month so that you know that this month, if I have all of my staff still employed, if I have a reduction in my supplies needs, what is the cash that I need this month? How does that compare to the cash I have on hand? So determining what your true cash need is and, and then also understanding what it is for the coming months and basically how much do you need each month to be able to survive through this thing until we start getting other reliefs in place. That's the starting point, just knowing what, what you need and how long does the cash you currently have, will it be able to extend that out? Now we figure out, okay, now that I have the baseline of what is the cash I have, what options do I have to be able to make that last longer, reduce those expenses or increase the revenue at the top, the cash available. So that includes calling your bank, contacting your small business association, figuring out which expenses that you can halt, can you, that you have, that anything that you're planning to do prepayment on, if especially if it's a loan, can you hit those, can you pause those? What are the things that you could potentially do for your defined benefit and 401k plan? For your independent practices where a physician might be um, doing draws regularly, consider discontinuing payroll or reducing the draw on those physicians to truly what is necessary. This is for, really for owner physicians to have that conversation of how much can we cut back on our draw and stay afloat for a period of time to maximize our cash needs now with considering doing a true up when we're in a better position. Reevaluate your supply, um, your supply pur purchases and understand what is it, what do you truly need? If you're going to be closed down, what automatic, sometimes we have automatic supplies 
that we're getting in, including office supplies, can we go ahead and make sure we cease those for the time being? Stretch your accounts payable as far as you possibly can and understand what other credit lines you have available. With that, I do want to talk about to the SBA loans. Unfortunately, the CARES Act did not have a specific provision, much to my chagrin when I was going through it this morning, of um, specific relief for physician practices. Right now, it's being deferred to a department. You know, this will be handled by a department. We'll figure out how to distribute the funds across the healthcare entities. It is not defined in the CARES Act. One section that is defined is with regards to SBA loans. These are small business association loans. Under the CARES Act that just got passed, a small business defined as somebody under 500 employees, so these independent practices, this is you, and you can apply for these loans where you can get relief of up to two and a half times your payroll cost from last year. So if you go through and calculate your entire payroll cost, and that's including premiums, sick leave pay, um, state and local taxes for employees, those different things all can be um, rolled up, multiply that by two and a half, and you can do the, le um, the lesser of $10 million or that the amount from that calculus. I do note that on the salary piece, they have called out that if you, that it'll, you can only include in your loan request for employees less paid less than $100,000 per year. So if you're physicians, if your salary, it does not, and it does say salary is in like W-2 salary. So if a physician has been paying themselves on a K-1 basis as an owner and not taking a W-2 draw, you know, how you, how you address that in the payroll piece of it, you need to be careful there. Um, but being able to add up that full amount and you can apply for the Small Business Association loan with that, typically SBAs require you to provide collateral or some sort of guarantee. That has been waived um, for that. Also, the repayments on these loans, I do emphasize that this is a loan, not just relief funds, but a loan. The interest rate on that is, is capped at 4% with you being able to pay it off over the next 10 years. So this is a greatly advantaged loan to take, potentially take um, consideration of, and there's already people who have been on the SBA, the, I'll put it this way, the SBA loan site apparently has crashed at least once already today, but I would say this is a time to make sure, have your practice administrator, have whoever's your finance, ask your accountant to be taking care of this for you, not your clinician, you know, depending on who handles the finances of that practice. Um, note that the loan proceeds can cover things other than payroll. You can use that to make your pay the mortgage if you if the physician practice owns the building, the rent, utilities, other other debt obligations that you have. So it doesn't have to be just used for payroll, but that's how they're calculating it. One thing I want to point out though is that if you do lay off employees during this time, anybody who is laid off their salary and expense and any sort of payroll costs associated with them get deducted from the calculation because they're trying to do this to incentivize um, businesses to be able to continue to employ um, staff. So if you are planning, if, you're, if your plan is the practice is closed, I'm going to, discon I can't afford, I have to discontinue staff. Um, it is unclear now if you lease, the, if you lease your staff to the hospital from our reading of the act, that does not mean that that staff cost is not included in your payroll cost. So even if you lease that person out, or if you utilize independent contractors, they can still be included in the calculus for this loan. So don't use that as a, oh, I shouldn't lease my staff to the hospital, or maybe, or the hospital say, I shouldn't pay for that lease of those staff that I need to be able to use at this time, because it, um, it doesn't impact that. Last thing I want to go over today um, before we get to questions is there has been a letter that has been signed by a significant number of groups um, asking for what the specific relief should be for healthcare providers. The NRH, the National Rural Health Association, assigned us the American Academy of Family Physicians, the um, AMGA, and other entities. There's at least seven that are listed have signed this letter that went out today about how we can stabilize provider revenue at this time, given the fact that care is being so disrupted. So the, the letter call, um, we'll see what happens with this. And of course, we will keep you updated as we know things. But it is asking to expand you know, the applicability to all providers, establish a simple streamlined process. And, and it's really focused on these periodic interim payments, knowing that our care has been disrupted. Can we get periodic interim payments that are actually tied to 
what we provided the last year and actually go ahead and set those payments out. Can we make sure that these are actually two relief payments rather than loans? Um, if they are going to be loans, can they be over what is the extended period of time that we're going to be able to have to pay them out? What is going to be the reconciliation period, making sure that we have a, that we're covering a longer period of time, knowing how unexpected this is and be able to go ahead and receive those monies now. Um, with that, it's also asking with there's, um, can we waive requirements because you still have to do clean claims right now um, within 30 days as for 85% of that can knowing it, how uncertain some of the billing is right now, especially on the telehealth side, can we get waive requirements for that? So I just put in here, basically, here are the things that are called for in that letter. Specifically, we'll see what happens with that. This is proposed. This is not legislation. It is calling on, hey, the CARES Act did not address these things. Whoever's going to distribute the money needs to be paying attention to that. So with that, I will say some key things from today's webinar. Please, right now, understand what your true supply is, what's going to impact it, what is the demand in your community knowing that your supply of providers and staff are going to be disrupted plan for absenteeism work with the providers this is a time that we have an opportunity to really come together and work together create that buy-in and work with people we've historically maybe competed with to have a really truly integrated system that can provide the care we need at this time and maximize our supply also, make sure you use this as an opportunity to, if you weren't doing team-based care before, if you weren't a primary care um, home that before, med, sorry, primary care medical home before, use this as an opportunity to make sure everybody is at the top of their license. Whether you are at a hospital or you are in a physician group, please make sure you are preserving your cash. We do not know how long this is going to last, and you are going to need to be able to have those cash on hand for covering your expenses and being able to create the longevity of your practice. Have, make sure that you have somebody who is assigned to monitor. It, there's so much information coming out right now that it's very confusing and it can be very tempting to have 20 different people who are constantly checking a site. Have somebody who is specifically in charge of keeping your group informed as to what is going on and, and updating people and updating those who are in charge of whoever's in charge of calling the SBA, whoever is in charge of monitoring supply inventory, whoever's in charge of doing the physician contract. Have somebody who's assigned to monitor those changes and get uh, and make sure that other people are informed. Keep in mind certain regulations um, have still apply. We do not have blanket waivers at this time, and that the documentation and timeliness for billing still applies. So in any of your training, make sure people know minimum required documentation so that the care you do provide during this time, you can get paid for um, as much as possible. So with that, I thank everybody for their time today, and I um, will go to see if anybody has any questions with the few minutes that we have remaining. And please feel free to use the question section of the GoToMeeting screen if you have a question you want to type in. Unfortunately, it's a very large group, so we are not able to open up the microphones to everybody at this time. And I do not see any other questions at this time. Okay. Um, great. And also, if um, if you do think of questions as you have shared this, please feel free to reach out. Um, we will do our best to to answer those and also keep everybody well informed as the changes as they are coming on. And as I said, please share this uh, information with your independent providers so that they are knowing what they need to do to be able to stay afloat at this time. Still no questions, so I think, thank you very much. Thank you.